Genesis uh, chapter um, 6, and we've been going through and talking about Noah. And um, a lot of times when, when guys go through and, and talk about Noah, they'll just go through and, and just do the story and, and that kind of thing. And I never do that because we live in a world where we get attacked left and right uh, um, as far as the validity of the Bible. And this is one of those passages in the Bible that um, on, uh, from unbelievers, um, even to Christians, uh, people attack the story of Noah and say that it's not true, that it couldn't happen, that it's just ridiculous. And, you know, you silly Christians, you believe in Noah's Ark and, and all of that kind of thing. And so one of the things I wanted to do as we were going through and talking about the man uh, was just go through and, and give you some evidences and some uh, reasons that you can, you can actually trust the text, um, trust what it has to say. And a, a lot of times because of where we grow up and uh, what we're taught in school, um, we don't know about a lot of the things that I'm just gonna I'm just gonna be giving to you. And you know, um, I'm I'm a geek, and uh, you know I like science and and all of that kind of stuff. And I'm gonna try to keep it you know uh, on a level where it's it's um, uh, something that um, uh, everybody understands. I'm not gonna try to do a college class here or anything. Uh, but there are some concepts that that you just need to know that are there. There, there's some evidences that you need to know are there. I don't expect you to necessarily walk out with them and have them memorized, but you need to know that they exist because uh, unless you're on the other side of the whole evolution thing, um, you, they, they literally are not dealt with. Uh, there, there are things that um, evolutionists, evolutionary scientists know in their fields that they've just set aside and they don't talk about it because it doesn't fit the, the story basically, but it does fit this story, and it's really interesting stuff. So in any case, we've been going through Noah's Ark, and uh, let's, let's go back in uh, verse 13 of uh, chapter 6 and just pick it up there and uh, just, just talk about this whole thing. Uh, verse 13, it says, and God said to Noah, oh, you know what, let's pray before we start. I forgot to pray. Um, God, we come before you and thank you, Lord, that, that you're a God who knows the end from the beginning. Uh, you're a God who, when you put something down for us, uh, we can absolutely trust it, uh, that it is actually your word and it is actually true. And uh, I just love that about you. I, I, I love the fact that real science does not conflict with what the Bible has to say. And so, Lord, as we go through and talk about some of those things, I just pray that you'd help me to be able to make those things clear. Uh, but most of all, Lord, um, I just love being able to go through passages like this and, and, and show that you're the God of all creation. You made this place. You know how it runs. You, you, you know what you've done with it. And uh, you've left plenty of evidence that, that you're real and that you have um, interfered in the affairs of men. And uh, you continue to do that. Lord, we just uh, pray that you bless the study this evening and that you do this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, verse 13, it says, And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me. How much of the flesh? All of it. And I'm doing that on purpose. Uh, For the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make your, yourself an ark of gopher wood. And we don't know what gopher wood is. This is one of those uh, terms in Hebrew that's archaic in the extreme. We don't know what it is. And it, it, it's obviously going to be some type of hardwood. Uh, most wooden ships were made of oak. Um, and so it would be some type of hardwood. But again, it's, it's an ancient uh, term, and we don't know exactly what it is. It says, make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. Okay? Is that word cover? It's the word that's used for atonement in other passages. Um, in, the old, in the Old Testament, one of the things that sacrifice used to do for us, uh, to do for the Jews specifically, not, not for me because I've never, never been Jewish, but, and I didn't live in the Old Testament. But one of the things that sacrifice did was it covered your sin. And so when, when they would um, use the terms for sacrifice and say that the sacrifice was going to give you atonement, it was the idea of God coming along and with blood 
covering over your sin so that God's not no longer looking at the darkness of your sin. Now he's looking at it through blood. And that was called the atonement. And it's the same term that's used here for covering the ark. And, you know, that's just kind of an interesting thing. Another thing that you see in this passage is that it's a, God says, cover it inside and outside with pitch. Normally, when you pitch a boat, you do it on the outside. And obviously, the pitch is a waterproof covering, right? And so the, the wood's gone together, and what they're doing is filling, filling in seams and cracks with something that's waterproof. And um, what God tells them to do is put it on the inside too. And why would you do that? Because once you, you know, if you, if you have a leak that springs from the outside, and especially depending on where it's at on the vessel, uh, the further down uh, under the water it's, it gets, the more pressure there is going to be going inside. And you can pitch it all day long inside, and it's not going to keep it from leaking. So why would you pitch it on the inside? And there have been some people who have thought that there's a possibility that the reason that God wanted to do that was to preserve it. And so have you heard the stories of Noah's Ark up on Mount Ararat? There is this continual history of people going up on Mount Ararat and finding this huge boat. This actually, and, it's, and um, every time it's described, it's described as a, as a rectangular, really large boat. And um, there are even stories from uh, World War I where some of the uh, Russian soldiers, you know, that, that uh, the area of uh, the Soviet Union is on the border of Turkey, and Mount Ararat is on that border, on the border between uh, the Soviet Union and, and uh, so, or, uh, Soviet Armenia and Turkey. And so it's on the border, and it's one of the reasons that um, there hasn't been a lot, a huge amount of exploration up there because the Soviets have never wanted anybody up there, and the Turks are pretty sensitive to that whole thing. But in World War I, there, there are stories about um, Soviet soldiers. Well, they weren't Soviet. They were Russian soldiers um, at that point. It was during the, the Bolshevik Re Revolution. Going up, uh, there, was a, there was a flight of planes that went by, spotted this object on the mountain. A group of, of uh, Soviet or uh, Russian soldiers, again, went up and actually viewed the ark, got into it, climbed into it, and described it just as the Bible says. Three decks, uh, it was broken on the end, and so they were able to get into, into the whole thing. And you have these stories over and over, all through the ages, you know, all through, all through history, um, of people going up on Mount Ararat and finding the ark. Um, one of the things that you have with Mount Ararat is um, it's glaciated. So there's a glacier. And so uh, for much of the year, it's covered up. And it's only on, in summers that are um, radically hot when the ice melts back that people actually see this thing. And so um, it's something that you'll hear periodically about. And I don't know if it's up there or not. You know, if it, if it, if it is up there, it's been up there for 4,000 years. And that's a long time for a wood structure to last. And if it has lasted that long, it may have been because of that passage right there, where it's been pitched on the inside and on the out. It would act as a preservative. So I don't know, but all of that stuff's interesting to me. Um, there's a possibility that if um, God intended uh, for the ark to be found, that it might be one of those things that he wants to be found right before the end. You know, the Bible connects the last days to the days of Noah, just like it was in the days of Noah, Jesus said. So it will be in the, in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And so he uses the example of Noah and the ark. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, it talks about the, the fact that um, the world that then was perished being overflowed with water. But then it goes on and talks about the world that we have now isn't going to be destroyed by a flood. It's going to be destroyed by fire. And so there's this connection between the last days that take place um, in the pre-flood world to the last days that are going to take place with us. And so some people have speculated that maybe what God is doing with the ark, if it is still up there and it does get found, is he's giving one of those evidences for mankind right before the end comes that he really is God and what the Bible says is really true. Can you imagine if they actually find Noah's ark and it's documented? It, it, you know, what, what would you say if you were an evolutionist? 
Because if it's up on the top of the, you know, the mountain's thousands of, of feet tall. I think it's 16,000 feet tall. And so it's up on, uh, up around the 15,000 foot level that they always see Noah's Ark. And so how does a, how does a huge boat get at 15,000 feet? You know, and I'm sure that they'll come up with stuff. Well, it's, you know, they built it up there or something like that. And why is it sitting on ice? Um, some of the latest stories have it um, poking out of the ice. It's broken in half. Uh, part of it's slid down the side of the mountain. And the other part is up in the glacier itself. And so um, possibility that's still up there. I don't know that for sure, but really interesting. It says, this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. And we talked about that last time. It's width 50 cubits and it's height 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and you shall finish to it to a cubit from above and set the door of the ark in its side. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. We talked about that last week. The animals that were put on the ark were animals that um, were air-breathing animals in the sense that um, they could not live in water. It's, it's that kind of idea. And so obviously, um, fish are not going to need to be on the ark and, and that kind of thing. Verse 18, it says, but I will establish my covenant with you. You shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind, and of a creeping things of the earth after its kind, two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. So did Noah go out with a butterfly net collecting animals? No. There, there's, there are miracles involved with the story of Noah's Ark. And one of the major miracles is that God caused the animals to come. Noah didn't go out collecting animals. God caused them to come. Can God do that? Yeah, absolutely. If you can get past verse 1 of Genesis 1, then the rest of the Bible's easy. Um, and so even though, you know, I'm going to go through and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some things that we see in science and, and, uh, and some possible mechanisms uh, for the flood uh, tonight, one of the things that you need to remember is that what we have here um, uh, is a, a situation where God is inter intervening in human events and he's doing it miraculously. So the fact that two animals of every kind, and later on we're going to see seven animals of the clean animals, are going to come to Noah, it's miraculous. Can you imagine Noah sitting there? He gets done with the ark. He builds this whole thing. I don't know if he had a group of contractors helping him or not. But, uh, you know, he builds this whole thing. And you can imagine people just mocking him the whole time that it's going on. And again, it's a great picture of being a last days believer. Noah is preaching to these people of things that they had never seen. And one of the things that we talked about a couple of weeks ago is there's a possibility that it had literally never rained on the planet, that the, that the whole hydrologic system was absolutely different than it is today. That's what the Bible indicates. And so Noah may be talking to them about rain, and, you know, the, these people don't have to be stupid scientifically. Um, the, one, of, one, of the, one of the issues that you have with rain, and we talked about this again a couple of weeks ago, the reason that it rains is because um, clouds uh, get filled up with water vapor. Have you ever wondered why every cloud doesn't just precipitate? Why it doesn't just rain out of every cloud? Well, yeah, it's got to reach a certain temperature and that kind of thing. But, there, but what happens is the, the water condenses on nuclei of condensation. And so and basically what that is is dust. There has to be enough dust in the atmosphere for the water to condense on it. You know how water condenses on your glass in the summer? Yeah, it's the same thing when it rains. And so there has to be nuclei of condensation. That's what they call that. It's just dust. It has to be dust far enough up in the atmosphere for the water to condense around. And so there, there, there's this level that um, it comes to where um, the water will finally condense out. The reason that it rains up against mountains is because what's happening is the clouds are going up higher and it's getting colder but there still has to be nuclei of condensation to get that water to come out. 
And um, if there is no dust, then there is no rain. It doesn't matter. It can be it can be 100% humidity in a cloud, totally soaked. If you have no dust, there is no rain. The reason there's dust in the atmosphere is because of wind. And so if you ever had a situation where the wind stops, you're not going to get rain. The Bible talks about it in the book of Revelation, that God stops the wind. And there are um, there is a reference to the two witnesses in the book of Revelation who are able to stop it from raining. And the only thing that you have to do to stop it from raining is stop the wind. And then it can't rain, okay? And um, one of the things that we're going to talk about is the whole idea of a water um, canopy up above the atmosphere. And if that existed, then what it would do is cause a worldwide warm climate, uh, you know, because of greenhouse effect. And that itself would uh, cause low winds. You wouldn't have the temperature differentials. The reason we have wind now is because it's cold at the poles and it's hot at the equator. And so those temperature differences cause wind. And that's how, how it goes. If you had a worldwide warm climate, you would have very little wind. You have very little wind. You don't have nuclei of condensation. You don't, th you don't have that. It doesn't rain. Okay? Um, and so Noah's going, it's going to rain 40 days and 40 nights, and you're all going to be flooded, and you're all going to die. And an up-to-date, scientifically literate, pre-flood person could talk to Noah and go, that's ridiculous, and here's why. And he could explain it to him. It cannot rain, and here's why, and would be able to explain it to Noah. And so Noah would look like a fool, scientifically, that's, if that's all true. I'm doing a bunch of ifs there. But if that's all true, he would look scientifically like, like a fool. And the same thing, thing can go on with us when we talk to people about events that are going, going to go on around us and, and uh, that kind of stuff. I remember when I was a kid, I would be telling people about the, the fact that the Bible talks about there's going to be a, um, a cashless society and that everybody's going to um, pay for things with a number that's marked on their right hand or on their foreheads. And I had conversation with guys, conversations with guys who, would, who told me that's impossible. That's impossible. This is in the 70s. You know when personal computers were created? Yeah, in the late 70s, 78, 79. And so I'm hearing about this in 75. I'm telling guys this, and they're like, there is no way that that can happen. And then, you know, as time went on, obviously, we're in a situation where um, it's, it, it's looking like uh, it, it can't not happen. And so, you know, again, you have those kinds of things going on. So, verse 21, it says, You shall take for yourself of all food that is eaten. You shall gather to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them. And thus Noah did, according to all that God commanded him, so he did. He builds an ark. He gathers food. The animals haven't shown up yet. And he's all doing it in preparation for, the, for an event that the only way he knows it's going to happen is because God said so. And there are going to be times in your life where God puts you out on a limb, basically. You're going you're gonna to have to trust him in issues. He's going to speak to your heart about something that's going to come to pass, and you're going to have to trust him that that's exactly what he's going to do, and you're going to have to act on it before you have any evidence of it. The only evidence you have of it is the fact that God spoke to you about it. And so that's what's happening with Noah. Can you do that? Or do you have to have God prove everything to you before you move on anything? And one of the, one of the, one of the places that we're supposed to be with the Lord is we're supposed to be people who trust him. And you don't have the ability to show trust for God, um, tro show trust to God without um, taking him at his word with no proof in the sense of, I got, I, I got nothing, I don't see it. You don't have the ability to trust him until you're in that position. And you guys have already done that. Um, because what God said was, if you come to me and you confess your sins, I'll forgive you. I will save you and you'll go to heaven. How do you know that's true? Because I said so? Because the Bible says so? Yeah. 
And at some point, what you have to do is you have to trust God on issues. It's like that with a number of things in the Bible. You have to trust God on who he is. You have to, have to trust God on what he's done. You have to trust God on the fact that he's made a place for you. You have to, you have to trust God on all, everything that has to do with anything spiritual, you're absolutely trusting God on because you have no evidence for it. You don't know that it's true. And we can, we can do personal testimony, Jesus's personal testimony. Um, but again, what I'm doing is I'm trusting the guy, right? And so um, Noah was in that position and he absolutely did it. It's, pretty, it's a pretty bold and gutsy move. Then the Lord said to Noah, come into the ark. Notice the, the term that's used there, uh, the verb there, come into the ark. So where is God? He's inside the ark. And he's telling him to come inside. The ark in the Bible is a picture of salvation. And so it's, it's a place of protection from the judgment that's coming down on the world. And where's God? God's inside. And so God says, come into the ark. It's a pretty cool thing. Um, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation, you shall take with you seven of uh, each of every clean animal, a male and his female, two each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female, also seven each of birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the face of all the earth. Why seven? Yeah, at the end, what's going to happen is there's going to be a sacrifice. And so you have one animal for sacrifice and you have six other animals who are paired off and because later on they're going to be used for sacrifice and for meat. Um, at, the, at the end of the story of the ark is when God gives people permission to eat meat. Before this point, they were eating vegetables. And that's another one of those things. Why the change? Why the change? And the reason that there was a change before the flood to after the flood is because obviously after the flood, everything's been devastated. So when Noah gets off the ark, there's not a lot of vegetables around, right? Okay, so you got that going on in the first place. And in the second place, most of the species that you have on the planet, most of the, most of the plant kinds and even the animal kinds that you had on the planet before the flood are gone. They've been destroyed. There were a lot of species that were wiped out, including plant species. Have you heard of coal beds? You know what coal beds are? Lots of plants laid down under sediment. It's always under sediment. So sediment is, is dirt that's been transported by water. Under sediment, huge. It has to be huge amounts because, you know, when you're, when you're talking about a coal seam that's six feet tall, you're talking about a vegetable mat that's multiple times that. It's all been compressed. And so it's a huge amount of vegetation that has been compressed down to get, to get these things. And there are some creationists that have gone through and looked at uh, the coal beds and, the, uh, and um, all the oil and all of these things that we use as fossil fuels. They are all um, organic materials that have been laid down under sediment, under, under a flood, literally under a flood and they've looked at the amount of those things and it's obviously a lot copious amounts and they've estimated that there are probably 500 times the amount of vegetation on the planet back then that there is now and so obviously the whole um, ecosystem changed from before the time of the flood to after the time of the flood there were probably a lot of other plants uh, that were around that um, could supply the protein and that kind of stuff that we need uh, to survive. And after the flood, it wasn't there anymore. And so that's when God changed the eating habit, habits of mankind. Um, for after seven more days, verse four, I will cause it to rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights, and I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things I have made. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters were on the earth. So Noah with his sons, his wife, and his sons' wives went into the ark because of the waters of the flood, of clean animals and of animals that are unclean, of birds and of everything that creeps on the earth. Two by two, they went into the ark to Noah, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth. So apparently he starts loading the ark about seven days beforehand. So it wasn't until the week before the flood came 
that the animals actually came. Well, I don't even know that. Maybe the animals were already coming and they were milling around outside the ark or something. But it wasn't until seven days before the flood came that they began um, putting the livestock onto the ark. And so for seven days, Noah and his family were living inside the ark with the livestock. And then it says it came to pass, verse 10, after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. And so in the Bible, there are two sources for the flood waters. It says the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. Now, the windows of heaven is pretty obvious to us. That would be rain, right? And so something's, you know, water's falling down from heaven. What are the fountains of the great deep? And I'm not going to do it, but you can go back and you can read in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, from the Garden of Eden, it says that there were four rivers that sprang forth from an um, artesian spring, basically. Four rivers ran out of the Garden of Eden. And they came up from the water and the or from the ground. And the Bible says that there was no rain in those days, but a mist came up from the earth and watered the ground. And so, you know, there's there's some there's some issues that are going on there that are pretty interesting. For a mist to, for a mist to come up and be able to water the earth in that way, um, it had to be a, a highly humid environment, highly humid environment. For that, to, that kind of stuff to go on. Plus, there has to be subterranean waters. If this mist is coming up from under the ground, there has to be lots of subterranean water. And that's what it's speaking about when it speaks about the fountains of the great deep. Apparently, there was water under the crust. Um, I shouldn't say under the crust because that puts it further, you know, deeper than it needs to be. But there must have been some kind of uh, situation where there were lar large amounts of water under the ground, not just, you know, a water table, but water under the ground that was able to get up above the earth and literally water the earth. We've got some evidence of that. Have you ever been to Carlsbad Caverns? Places like that? Um, obviously, these are places that had lots of water flowing through them at some time in the past. What we see there now is nothing in comparison to what it had to be before. And you have these caverns all over the place, all over Mexico. You have it all over the Appalachian Mountains. You have it all, all, all through New Mexico. That's where Carlsbad Caverns are. You have it in the Sierras. You have it all in all these different places. You have these, these cavern systems that many times can just go on for miles. And if that was something that was going on over all the earth, then you got something interesting that's going on there. The Great Deep is, uh, can also be speaking about the oceans, too. And so verse 12, so two sources for the flood water, rain from out of the sky and something that's coming up from the earth. Okay, if the fountains of great deep are broken up, and when you're talking about fountains, you're talking about something that's artesian, you're talking about groundwater that's coming up. If it's broken up, what has to be broken for that to happen? Yeah, the land has to be broken. The earth has to be broken. So there's got to be some kind of structural change that's going on with the earth itself for that to happen. It says, and the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. And so we know that how long it rained. And this is probably talking about, you know, monsoon type uh, rain that was taking place. Un, uh, rain that was without stop, without a stop for 40 days and 40 nights. <clears throat> on the very same day, Noah and Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. They and every beast after its kind, all cattle after their kind, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, and every bird uh, after its kind, every bird of every sort. And they went into the ark to Noah, two by two, of all flesh, and which is the breath of life. So those that entered male and female of all flesh went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. So who shut the door? It was the Lord. Isn't that interesting? So Noah builds a door. God says, come on in. And then when Noah and all the animals get inside, God shuts the door. That's kind of creepy. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, and the door's shut. That's kind of a cool thing because that's a picture of salvation too. So when you become a believer, 
um, it's not the kind of thing where you become a believer and there's a, there's a chance of you falling away by accident, for example. So do you, do you think that Noah could, could have fallen off the ark? Well, sure he could have. If he was outside, on the outside of the thing, hanging out on the top deck, right? But where's he, where's he living? Yeah, he's living on the inside. And so as long as he's on the inside of the ark, you got nothing to worry about, okay? God shut the door. So there's a door there, but God shut it. And so, you know, are, are they gonna be able to open the door? Yeah, at the end, they open the door, right? And uh, as a matter of fact, they take the roof off. So this is the point that I'm, that I'm making. For Noah to get off the ark, he would have had to work at it. You know, to, for Noah to fall off the ark, he'd have to be in a really stupid place to fall off the ark, right? And all he did was he just stayed in the place where God, that God provided for him. And that's what salvation is like. You just stay in the place where you don't, it, it, was the ark trying to get away from Noah? <laughs> He's just inside it. And so when we become believers, we come inside. God tells us to come. You know, Jesus talks about coming to me, all you who are laboring and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Learn from me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart. And you'll find rest for your souls. And so Jesus tells us to come. And we come inside this relationship with God. And then Jesus says, now just stay here. That's all there is to it. Come and stay. Abide is what he says. You abide in me. My words abide in you. Ask what you will, it'll be done for me. Abide in me like a, like a branch abides to a vine. It just means stay. Just, you know, just stay. It's not a big deal. You just stay. And so you have the same thing with, with Noah and the ark. I, I just love this story. So it says, verse 17, Now the flood was on the earth 40 days. The waters increased and lifted up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and greatly increased on the earth, and the ark moved about on the surface of the waters, and the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. And I made a point last week of, of going through all these passages that talk about the fact that um, the, the, um, the flood was global. All the high hills under the whole heaven. I want you to notice it doesn't say all the high mountains. That's a, that's a particular word in Hebrew. And you know what it means? It means hills. You know why? Because back before, well, actually, everybody will tell you whether they're a creationist, somebody who believes in Noah's flood, or whether they're an evolutionist, everybody will tell you that for the major, the majority of the history of this planet, there were no high mountains. Did you know that? So high mountains are from the late tertiary when you're talking about geological ages. And so um, it's literally after the dinosaurs is when the high mountains started showing up, you know, in, as far as evolution goes. And mountains come from two crustal plates hitting each other. So you have, you basically, the earth is a sphere. I'm going to, well, let's, let's do some stuff. Let's, let's get there. There's all the Noah's Ark stuff that we did last week. Getting close. This is a, uh, um, Anil, is that, can you see that going? Yeah. Right. This is a, this is a video uh, or basically an animation of a thing called Pangea. And what, um, uh, what scientists believe is actually, it's not just a belief. The, this, is, this is a sure deal. Um, the earth used to be, uh, all, all, the, all the land mass used to be in one continent, basically. And so that first land mass there is what was called Pangea. And over time, what's happened is the crustal plates on the earth have been spreading. The earth is cracked, and it's cracked in a number of places. Let me, let me give you an illustration of that. See this right here? This is an, this is an example of uh, a number of uh, subduction zones and uh, places where the uh, where literally the earth is splitting apart. So a subduction zone is usually up on, up against a continent. And so if you look on the west coast of uh, North America, there, 
that's a subduction zone. You have the continental plate, North America is sitting here like this, and then you have a, an oceanic plate that's going down underneath it. There's a crack there. That's why we have earthquakes and volcanoes and stuff like that over, on, over in uh, western Washington. And that's why you have the San Andreas Fault down in Southern California and, and places like that. In fact, all around the uh, uh, Pacific Rim, it's a subduction zone. So the, the, oh, the continents are literally riding up over the top of the ocean plates is what's happening. And in the middle of the Atlantic, you see that line that goes right down through the middle of the Atlantic? That line is a place where the crust is splitting. It's splitting apart and it's moving the continents apart. So the earth is cracked. It's cracked all over the planet. And those are, those are examples of those cracks. Um, you see that uh, there, there's a line, you, you guys see where India is? You have the Eurasian plate there. And that pointy part going straight down is India. And that, there, there's another line that's going across there, that's another subduction zone. Remember that earthquake that just took place a few years ago, where you had the Malaysian earthquake with the big tsunami and all that stuff? It's right on that zone. So most of the earthquakes and, and uh, that kind of thing that, that takes place on the planet are taking place in those areas. And this is what that looks like. In the middle, you have this uh, oceanic plate and if you, if you look down towards the, the sides there, you see where the land is and you see the volcanoes and stuff like that, there's an area where the oceanic plate just slips down underneath the continent and goes down into the mantle and it melts, okay? So the oceans are splitting, the ocean, the ocean plates are splitting basically in the Atlantic, moving the continents apart. And then up against the Pacific, because the continents are moving apart, the, the Pacific area, it's riding up over the, the Pacific plate. And that's where you get earthquakes, it's where you get most volcanoes and that, that kind of thing. That's what's going on. And so here is, these are those subduction zones. In the, in the middle, you see the areas, like in the middle of the Atlantic, um, you see the dark spots there? All these dark spots are earthquakes, okay? So those are where seismic events have taken place. And you see that most of the earthquakes that are taking place are taking place along those lines. They're taking place along those cracks in the earth. Um, the majority of the places where the earthquakes are taking place are in the subduction zones, where it's, where, where it's, it's going down underneath. Um, there are some where it's splitting, obviously, but where it's going down underneath, where the two plates are crunching together and, and riding along each other, that's where the major earthquakes take place. Um, India, when you, when you go back, let me get back to that. Oh, it's not gonna. It's not gonna show you. Uh, yeah, it's it's off on the uh, off on the side of the screen. There's a there's a there's a section on the right side of Africa there that kind of splits off and, and goes up towards the top. That's the Indian subcontinent, and the reason that we have the Himalayas is because the Indian subcontinent is slamming into the Eurasian plate, and it's buckling, and that's where you get high mountains. But before the the time of the flood. And actually, before the, if you're talking about geology, if you're talking about um, uh, uh, non-Christian evolutionary geology, it would be late tertiary. So before that time, there were no high mountains. You had this whole thing with Pangaea and these different plates and stuff like that. There was no, there were no areas where they were crunching into each other, and so you didn't have any high mountains. Both evolutionists and creationists are agreed on the fact that oceans used to be shallow and the, um, there were no high mountains. And one of, the, one of the questions that comes up is, where does all the water go from the flood? Number one, if you, if you, have, if you have a large flood like that, first off, how are you going to cover the Himalayas? 26,000 feet. How are you going to cover the Himalayas? And the answer to that is the Himalayas weren't there. You don't have to cover the Himalayas. And as a matter of fact, if you took the whole earth and just made it like a, just made it like a, like a, like a, a smooth ball, like a pool ball, if you took the whole earth and made it a smooth ball, you'd have water covering it two miles deep. There's plenty of water to cover the earth. It's a matter of how high things were on the continents before the flood. And the Bible indicates high hills, not high mountains, it's high hills. 
that were going on. And that is consistent with what we know about geology. Okay, again, verse 20, it says, the waters prevailed 15 cubits upward and the mountains were covered. And how do you know that? How do you know it's 15 cubits? And Noah, get out there with a, you know, you know, some kind of depth gauge or you know, do you have sonar? What's, what's the deal with that? That's probably the draft of the ark. That's probably how, how much of the ark sat down in the water. And so Noah is going over areas in the ark that he knows. I'll get rid of that so this is not bugging you. Um, so that he, he knows that he's gliding over the top of the mountains at least 15 cubits high because that's, how, that's what the draft of the ark would be. Then it goes on, verse 21, and it says, And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and every man, all in whose nostrils was, was the breath of life, all that was on the dry land died. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing and bird of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. And the waters prevailed. That literally means were strong or mighty, on the earth 150 days. That's the idea of the waters kept rising for 150 days. And so Noah is on the ark. It rains for 40 days and 40 nights. If that was all the source of the water, then after 40 days, the water should prevail for 40 days and then go down. But that's not what happens. It prevails for 150 days. So that's 40 days, and then at least another 110 days for that water to keep rising. So where's that water coming from? And again, there are only two sources. One is the, the uh, windows of heaven were opened, the rain, and the other source would have to be these subterranean waters. So um, what I would propose to you is that there were no cracks before the flood. And it wasn't until the flood comes that the earth gets cracked and we have this whole thing going on with plate tectonics. It goes on here and it says, then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark and God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were also stopped and the rain from heaven was restrained and the waters receded continually from the earth at the end of the 150 days, the waters decreased. So that 150 days is the amount of time that the waters were increasing. They, they reached their height. And then after 150 days, the waters began decreasing. Okay? Which again tells you that this is a huge flood. Okay? 100, 150 days, you know, that's five months that you're talking about. So the waters are increasing for five months. And I've heard all kinds of stories about the flood. And, you know, maybe, maybe it was just, you know, the waters from one side of the ocean lapped up and came over to, you know, uh, like there was a big tidal wave or something like that. And it just came up over the top of the land and carried Noah and the ark off, on, uh, off onto the ocean and, and that kind of stuff. That's not what the text says. It says it kept rising for 150 days. Five months it kept rising. Then after five months, the waters start going down. So where'd the waters go? And again, what you've, what you've got is a, a situation where we're talking about plate tectonics. Let me, let me show you this again. Over on the right there, you have the continental crust. That is riding on magma. It's riding, it's riding on the molten layers of the earth. And so the continental crust is floating, okay? And then over on the left, what you have there is you have the oceanic crust. And that is also floating. And basically, these two things are balanced. And when, when you get to the end of the flood, what you have is basically an earth that, you know, for all intents and purposes, is all the same level. And what would have to happen to get the water to come down off the continents is there has to be something that causes that, that oceanic crust to start lowering. And it wouldn't take... You know, it's not like God has to push it down seven miles or something, you know, how deep the ocean gets. It's not like God would have to do that. The process would just have to start. And once the oceanic crusts start going down a little bit, what's going to happen to the water that's on the, on the continental crust? It's going to start flowing off, and it's going to go down onto the oceanic crust, right? And as that process um, starts, it's going to accelerate. 
because you, you have basically a balance thing going on. Because again, underneath you have liquid. This is all riding on, on liquid rock. And so you have this balance thing going on where it would just go like this. And so literally the Bible says in Psalm 104 that where the waters went was God lowered the valleys and the waters ran off, ran off, the, ran off the earth down into the valleys that were prepared for them. And at the end of this story, God says that he puts a boundary on the oceans so that it can never flood the earth again. And you know what the boundary is? It's that balance. You have these oceanic plates that are down below the, the continental plates. The ocean's in a place where it can't, it literally can't get out of the place that God's designed for it because of that whole balance issue. So the continental plates are riding up higher than the oceanic plates. To get that whole thing to go again, what you would have to do is literally push the continental plates down below the oceanic plates. And there's not a process that's going to, I mean, obviously God can do anything he wants, but there's not any kind of natural process that's going to do that. And on the other hand, when you talk about the beginning of the flood, what the, what the Bible indicates and what science indicates is that the earth was relatively flat in the sense of it was relatively ball-shaped and that the oceans were shallow. You didn't have this mild, you know, couple of mile deep thing going on with oceanic plates. It was more like this was what was going on. And so you don't, you don't have the, the same kind of situation before the biblical flood or uh, 250 million years ago. You don't have the same type of situation that we have nowadays with the way that the crust is. And so um, all of this water came from someplace, whether you're talking about uh, um, an evolutionary position on that or whether you're talking about a creationist position on that, if everybody agrees that we had shallow oceans, where'd the water come from? It had to come from someplace. And the Bible indicates that where, where it came from was up from underneath the ground. Again, the fountains of the great deep were broken up. And you have this whole thing going on. Again, it, uh, it says, uh, verse four, then the ark rested on the seventh month, the 17th day of the month on the mountains of Ararat. And the waters decreased continually until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. So you have the ark. Now you have a different word also, mountains versus hills. Okay. So you have the ark resting on the mountains of Ararat and that happens on the seventh month, the 17th day of the month. And in the 10th month, almost three months later, you start seeing the tops of the mountains. Okay, so it's, so it's resting on there. And it came to pass uh, at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark, which he made. Then he sent out a raven, which kept going to and fro until the waters had dried up from the earth. He also sent out from himself a dove to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot, and she returned into the ark to him, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and drew her into the ark to himself. And he waited yet another seven days. And again, he sent the dove out from the ark. Then the dove came to him in the evening, and behold, a freshly plucked olive leaf was in her mouth. And no one knew that the waters had receded from the earth. So he waited yet another seven days and sent out the dove, which did not return again to him any more. And so he sends out two birds. The first one is a raven. Ravens are different than doves. They can feed on carrion, basically. They can feed on, on dead animals. And so even though it's been months, you can imagine that there's all kinds of things floating out in the water. And the raven's going to be able to find things to eat. Doves are not the same way. And so the reason that he uses a dove after the, after the raven just disappears is because um, what he wants is to know when the dove is going to be able to live on the earth, and that's not going to happen until the waters have receded and the dove has a source of food, basically. The dove's going to come back to him until that, until that happens. And so that's what he's doing there. So the dove came back in verse, uh, again, verse 12. So he waited yet another seven days, sent out the dove, which did not return again to him anymore. And it came to pass in the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, that the waters were dried up from the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked and indeed the surface of the ground was dry. And in the second month, the 27th day of the month, 
uh, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dried. Then God spoke to Noah saying, go out of the ark. So if he's telling him to go out, where is he? He's still in the ark, right? Yeah, that's cool. All through that judgment, God was with him. You and your wife, your sons and your sons' wives with you, bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, bird and cattle and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him, every animal, every creeping, uh, uh, every creeping thing, every bird, whatever creeps on the earth according to their families went out of the ark. Now, what I, what I want to show you is 150 days the, ark, the uh, waters prevail then in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, Noah got on, on the ark on, in the sixth month, or excuse me, in the second month, the 17th day of the month. So he's been on the ark for 150 days. Get that? It's five months later. And that's when the ark rests on the mountains of Ararat. And then it's not um, for another seven months or so that Noah finally gets off the ark waiting for this water to recede. So it took seven months for the water to recede far enough for Noah to get off the ark and, and, and be reasonably sure that the animals could get it off and they could go out and they could exist and, and do that whole thing. Seven months of receding waters. That's a lot of water once again. And so you had this period of time that it was going on. So how do you flood a world? Let's, let's talk about that a little bit. And that's, that's the, the subject of this whole thing. Basically, um, what, the, what the Bible talks about is the fact that the earth um, at the very beginning had one continent. We talked about that when we first started this whole thing. So when scientists look at the earth and they see that it's spreading out and they started in one continent, they're about, you know, um, well, Moses lived right around 1400 BC, okay? Moses is the one who at least collected the books of uh, the the book of Genesis and put it together. Moses is the author. So 1450 BC, you add 2000 to it, you got 3450 years. And so modern science didn't come up with this until like the 20th century. And so they're 3400 years behind the Bible. Because the Bible indicates all the land was in one place when it first started, okay? Just, just like this whole thing goes on. One of the things that um, a creationist scientist has come up with is this whole idea of catastrophic plate tectonics. And basically, that's that whole idea that we just saw with, with, with this animation right here where the, where the earth is spreading out. But what he postulated was that it didn't happen slowly over millions of years. It happened quickly over a short period of time. And then that, that may have been the cause of the, of the breaking up of the fountains of the Great Deep. In other words, there was this runaway uh, plate tectonics that took place that separated the continents quickly. And actually, um, this guy Baumgartner, he's a, he's a scientist, uh, put together a um, computer program that maps that whole thing. It's actually a computer program that is used by scientists all over the world for doing all kinds of different stuff uh, that in, include this kind of thing with uh, plate tectonics, other things too. In any case, um, he's well respected for doing this whole thing. In this picture here, um, he's got a model of catastrophic plate tectonics after 15 days. So after 15 days, that's how far the, um, the continent of Pangaea would have broken up and then he's got another one after 25 days. And you, you can see those, those breaks. Can you see that? Oh. Parent G6P. You got that? Okay. <laughs> we'll pray for you. <laughs> got it? Is it up there yet? Okay, so this is after, after 25 days. And so he postulated this whole idea that things split apart rapidly. And one of the things that, um, that we have going on in modern times is we have this idea that everything has to continue in the same way that it's always been, this, this whole kind of slow process. And that's where you get the whole idea of evolution and a lot of geology stuff is, uh, comes from that idea too. 
Um, that was something that was sac sacrosanct up until 1980. Um, the whole idea of catastrophes on the earth were not something that you heard about in science except for you know extreme guys like Velikovsky and, and guys like that up until 1980. And 1980 is when they postulated that whole thing with the, with the asteroid striking the earth and killing off the dinosaurs. That When that first came out, people poo-pooed the whole idea until they came up with more and more evidence and you know they'd always wondered what had happened to the to the dinosaurs. You guys grew up in in Washington a lot of you. You had Washington state history with the Missoula floods. Do you know that when when that geologist came out with that whole idea of the Missoula floods, it it took him it took him years and years to get any credibility with the scientific community on that whole thing because it was a catastrophe and things happen slowly over time they don't happen quickly according to uh, the, the thought of the time. And so it's only been in modern times, like re recent modern times, that anybody um, in geology has ever even allowed for a catastrophe at all. And it's because the flood's a catastrophe and we don't want to go there. One of the things, uh, again, that, that you have with this whole thing is, you know, I've already pretty much explained this thing with you, is we know this is happening. We know that things are moving because of GPS and you know, they, they measure the rates of moving and that kind of thing. And it's only, it's only basically you know, inches per year, uh, maybe an inch per year in, uh, in that kind of situation. Um, it's going radically slowly, but just because it's going slowly now doesn't mean that it couldn't have sped up before. I already, I already talked about this one, how this whole thing works, and we talked about this too. Um, here's something that's really interesting. And you know, I, I know this is kind of sciencey and stuff, but one of the things that they found, this is in the middle of the, of the Atlantic Ocean. They took a magnetometer, and it's, it, it's something that just measures the, the direction that basalts are magnetized. And what, what, I, what I mean by that is um, a basalt is lava, and when it gets laid down, it's, it's got um, minerals in it, that are magnetic, and so it can have iron in it, for example. And so you know that the Earth has a magnetic field, right? And so when, when, you, when you use a compass, the reason it points north is because it's being magnetically attracted to the north. Well, that happens in, in any kind of liquid that has iron filings in it, for example. So at the bottom of the ocean, there is new magma, basalts, that have the filings in it basically lined up to north, okay? The problem is that north keeps changing, okay? So up on the upper left, north is basically coming down towards us. Then you have another stripe, that, that one to the right, where north is going up away from us. So, so north is going this way and then north is going this way. And it goes back and forth. There are these stripes on the ocean where you, you have to have had field reversals. The magnetic field has to have reversed. So north, what we would call, well, actually what we would call north up over here would now be down there and back and forth, okay? Not only, this is, this is a little bit deceiving because in that bottom one, the, the, the third picture there, you see, you see the magma underneath and you see the crust and it looks like the, the stripe, that north stripe, is going all the way down to the magma. It's not. Because when they've drilled it, not only do they have field reversals where you know, the, the, the stripes on the, on the top of the ocean crust are going back and forth, in those those areas where, where it switches, it switches all the way down through the, through the basalt itself. So it's layered. It's going, it's going, it's, it's like this. All the way down. So when that magma, when that lava is getting laid down, there are field reversals that are taking place back and forth. Really weird stuff. And there is no explaining that with modern ideas of how you get a magnetic field. What we, what we have in schools today is what's called the dynamo theory. And it's, like, it's the idea that the earth is, 
is spinning, and so the magma on the inside is spinning in a certain way, and so it, it kind of acts like an alternator, um, and it's and it's making a dynamo and creating the uh, the magnetic field. Um, in actuality, what's happening is the magnetic field is decreasing over time. So, um, just read an article uh, from not too long ago. It's 10 percent less strong than it was in 1830. They've been measuring it since 1829. So from 1830 to this point, it's lost 10% of its strength. It has a basically a half-life of 1,400 years. So 1,400 years ago, it was twice as strong as it is now, okay? You add a, another 1,400 years, it gets exponential, then it's eight times as strong. It can only go so far back before that magnetic field to, uh, to make that magnetic field happen, you would literally be melting the earth. And so if there, if there, is, a, if there is basically a straight line decrease, it would be exponential, but a straight line decrease in the strength of the magnetic field, do you know how, the, how old the earth can be and only how old the earth can be? 20,000 years. It can't be any, be any older than 20,000 years. And so what they come up with is this whole dynamo thing, but the dynamo theory doesn't work. It's, it, there, there's some problems with it in physics and that kind of thing. But one of the things uh, that um, creation scientists have come up with is this idea that when God laid the foundations of the earth, basically, all you gotta do is take all the molecules and stick them in the same direction and you have a, a, an immediate jump off of a magnetic field because molecules, atoms, you know, that, that, that kind of thing, they have a magnetic field. You line them all up and you have a magnetic field. As soon as that happens, um, the earth begins spinning and when it begins spinning, it all starts getting mixed up. But you have the magnetic field to start and that spinning rotation continues that magnetic field, but over time it begins decreasing, which is exactly what we see. Now, you got to think of stuff going on inside the earth spinning around in there, right? All this fluid spinning around, and that's continuing the strength of the magnetic field. If you take something like an oceanic crust and you dump it into that, what you're going to do is you're going to stop the flow, and you're going to get eddies, and that kind of thing is going to be taking place. And you know what you get with that? What you get is field reversal. So all of a sudden, the magnetic field begins to flip-flop back and forth. And actually, it's the only explanation that um, anybody's ever come up with for why there would be magnetic field reversals. And so that's kind of a cool thing. Was that as interesting as listening to, I don't know, watching plants grow? Here's another thing that you have, and this is kind of an interesting thing. Um, when you look at the, at the crust of the ocean, when you look at the, the oceanic crust, um, there's only so much sediment on it. Literally, there's not enough sediment on the ocean floor. It's all, it, 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 it should, it should, there should be miles thick of, se of sediment on the ocean floor, and there just isn't. Every year, you get 20 billion tons of dirt and rock debris washed into the ocean and accumulate on the sea, sea floor. There's about a billion tons that are removed by tectonic plates where they're going back underneath the, you know, the continental plates. You got 19 billion tons of sediment on the ocean floor every year. And so, you know, when you're, when you're talking about the current thickness of the seafloor sediment, that would collect in less than 12 million years. Less than 12 million years. Um, the earth is billions of years old. The oceans have been on the planet since about a billion years after the earth was cre created. Where's all the sediment? And again, you know, I think, I think the, the reason is because um, there wasn't any. This is Enceladus. Um, and Enceladus is a moon of Saturn and it has all kinds of cracks in it. And um, it's really cold out there. And what happens with these cracks is there are areas where there are geysers literally on cracks on this moon that are shooting up out of the ground, 
okay? And you, you can see that kind of fuzzy area going right down the center and another fuzzy area off to the right. That's ice crystals that are coming up from Enceladus because the crust itself has been cracked. Um, and it's coming up from subterranean waters, up to subterranean seas, literally. Um, and we're talking about it's dirt on the top. There's lots of water underneath. It's been cracked and it's shooting up literally into space. That's how far it's shooting, okay? And this is, this is the, the way that um, uh, you, you have that whole thing going on. There's hot rock inside the um, moon itself. There's pressurized, pressurized liquid um, uh, water, and it obviously it heats up and it gets shoved up through those cracks in the uh, planet itself. And so you have this stuff going on. So what the Bible talks about with the breaking up of the fountains of the great deep is literally going on right now on one of the moons of Saturn. Okay? So it's not a big stretch for it to ha have happened here. Um, we talked earlier about a vapor canopy. And so you'd have waters on the earth with you have uh, heaven in between and then you have a water canopy above it. And that's where the waters um, uh, from the heavens might have come. Besides the fact that if you split the ground, like on Enceladus, and have subterranean water shooting up, they're literally shooting up to space. And so when you, when you have that kind of thing going on, when it gets to a certain height in the atmosphere, what it's going to do is it's going to spread out, and the water is going to precipitate back down on the earth. And so you would have that coming from the heavens also. And so um, this was that whole thing with the vapor canopy that we talked about earlier. And so you have that. So at the very beginning, what the Bible says is you have a world that has waters that are underneath the atmosphere, waters that are above the atmosphere. You have one continent, so you don't have all these cracks going on. And then something happens to cause this whole thing to break up. And, you know, one of the things that we know has happened is that big things have hit the earth. And part of the reason that we know that is because we can look at the moon. When I was a kid, there was an argument as to whether or not the craters on the moon were volcanic or whether or not they were meteoric, whether or not um, asteroids and stuff had hit the moon or whether or not it was just volcanism. You know why? Because nobody wanted to believe that the, um, that the solar system uh, could have gone through a period of time where there was catastrophic things like that going on. And so there's this big argument about it. And it wasn't until the moon shots that it was finally settled and, and uh, that kind of thing. We know that um, large things have hit the earth. And that's one of the, the reasons that um, people believe that um, the dinosaurs became extinct. And that was that whole I event that was down in uh, Central America. And so, you know, there's still some argument about that whole thing, but um, not much. And one of the things that could have caused this whole situation is you got the earth floating around out there and everything's fine. And then you have something large hit it. When you have it hitting the, hit the ground, what's it going to do? It's going to crack it. And that could be the beginning of that whole thing. Anyway, I'm giving you the short version of all this stuff. Um, and so this is what you would have. You would have subterranean water. See it down below the, the dirt there. You would have pre-flood mountains. You would have a pre-flood pre-flood pre, pre sea and you would have this fountain going up shooting up into the atmosphere and that's what would have caused the flood itself. So all this water that we have on the planet right now didn't used to be on the outside of the planet. Everybody agrees with that. All the water we have now didn't used to be on the outside of the planet. And so this is what the Bible says took place. I don't know where evolutionists, you know, get the whole idea that the oceans would get miles deep after the dinosaurs. And this is something along the lines of what it would look like. Those cracks that you have in the, in the middle of what we would call the oceans now, this is what it would have looked like, and you would have the, had the land flooded. And then um, you would have mountains rising up, and then you would have the oceanic plates going down, and that's where the waters would have gone, okay? And it might have looked something like that. Here's another thing. That's kind of a cool picture. Um, actually, did you see that movie, Noah? There, there were a couple of things that they got right. Not very many, 
but a couple of things that they got right. And they had a scene where the floodwaters start and they literally have their ground breaking up and water shooting out, out from underneath the ground. And they must have been talking to somebody because that's, that's straight out of the word of God. That's kind of cool. Um, here's another thing. Um, when, when you, and, and this is just for, for your edification, basically. There are all kinds of people who pick on Christians about, you know, long ages of the, of the, of the earth and, and, and all that kind of stuff. And animals living millions and millions of years ago and, and that kind of thing. And again, if you're not familiar with this stuff, you don't know anything about this. Have you heard of carbon-14 dating? How many of you heard of that? Um, is carbon-14 dating used to date dinosaur fossils? How many of you think yes? Good. That it's not used to date dinosaur fossils. And the reason is because carbon-14 gets created in the atmosphere, and it happens because these cosmic rays hit the atmosphere and hit nitrogen. Most of our atmosphere is nitrogen. They knock off basically a proton, and it becomes, it goes from nitrogen-14, um, which has an atomic number of seven, and it becomes carbon-14, which has a, uh, an atomic number of six, okay? So basically, it knocks off a particle. And when it does that, it makes it radioactive carbon, okay? Carbon combines with all kinds of stuff in nature, and one of the things it really likes to combine with is oxygen. That's where you get carbon dioxide, okay? So what do plants breathe? Carbon dioxide. And when, when you have this stuff going on, what happens is these plants ingest it and they're ingesting radioactive carbon, carbon into their systems, okay? Not only plants, but you're doing it too when you breathe, okay? And then what happens is after you die, after you stop ingesting this stuff, the carbon-14 begins to decay and it's got a half-life of 5,700 years, 5,730 years. So after 5,730 years, half of the carbon, like if I, if I croaked right now, in 5,730 years, if you came back to my body and you measured the amount of carbon-14 in me, I would only have half as much in 5,700 years that I do now, okay? That's how you date something with carbon-14 dating. So you can do it with wood. You can do it with any kind of, any kind of vegetable material. You can do it with animals and things like that. So... They, they date stuff like that um, all the time, okay? But it's got to be rel relatively recent because after about 10 half-lives, which is 57,000 years, there's not enough carbon-14 left to be able to pick out, basically. It's mostly gone. We've got some new measuring uh, methods. Um, it's called, um, oh, I'm blanking out. Uh, ASM, and I can't remember what it stands for. Any, anyway, um, literally can measure the atoms in a substance, okay? So it can literally measure the atoms of carbon-14, and you can get that dating method out to 80,000 years. But after 80,000 years, nothing can measure it anymore, okay? So that's the reason that you don't date dinosaurs with carbon-14, because after 80,000 years, it won't work anymore. But guess what some creationists did? Now, they didn't do dinosaurs. They did wood. So there are places in the earth where you can find wood that's been fossilized, but not completely. So there's still some wood in there. And so what they did, what they did is they took it to this radically um, intense measuring uh, system, and they dated, dated this wood. And so you have Oligocene from the Crescent Mine in Cripple Creek, you have Eocene wood, these are geologic ages, from Crinum Mine in, in Australia. Jurassic wood, you guys know Jurassic Park? That's dinosaur days, okay? Um, from uh, England, and you have Triassic wood, that's also dinosaur days, from, again, Australia. And here are the dates. They actually found carbon-14 in these pieces of wood. You can't do that for the ages of this wood. It's because Oligocene wood is 32 million years old, but it got dated to 41,260 years, okay? The Eocene wood, 
That's 45 million years old. That's what it's supposed to be. But they found carbon-14 in it, and they dated that anywhere from about 29,000 to 44,700 years. Okay? You shouldn't have any carbon-14 in this stuff. They dated um, Cretaceous wood. That's 112 to 120 million years. 32,000, 33,000, 37,000, 42,000 years for this stuff. Notice how it's all in the same date ranges, basically. Jurassic wood, 189 million years, 20,000, 22,000, 24,000, 28,000. Triassic, 22 to 230 million, or excuse me, that's, that should be 200, yeah, that's 220 to 230 million years, 33,000 years. And then uh, Permian layer, 250 million years, 33,700 years, plus or minus 400. You shouldn't have any carbon-14 in those samples at all. And so the fact that you have carbon-14 in them means that they're not that old. They can't be millions of years old, okay? Um, in another study, this is stuff that creation scientists have done, they took 10 coal samples from the U.S. Department of Energy um, uh, sample bank uh, maintained at Pennsylvania State University and they were selected as representatives of U.S. coal beds geographically, as well as with respect to depth in the geologic record of the flood. Coals buried in fossilized, pl fossilized plant material, including wood. These coal samples were from Eocene, and that uh, Eocene is 45 million years ago. Cretaceous, 112 to 120 million years ago. And in Pennsylvanian coal beds, which is 40 to, uh, uh, 40 to 300 million years on the conventional geologic time scale. So it's all over, the, all over the range. And when they dated these things with C14, uh, their levels in all 10 coal samples were equivalent to an age range of between 48,000 and 50,000 years. And it shouldn't have any carbon-14 in them at all. It shouldn't be there. Okay, so what's that mean? All those coal beds would have been laid down during the flood. And so if you're going to go and date them with any dating method, they should be close to each other. Guess what you find out with the coal beds? Yeah, they're all close, with the, close to each other. Um, what about the whole thing with the, um, with, the, with the thousands of years versus the biblical time scale? You know, I already talked to you about the, the uh, magnetic field. Um, when, when you have carbon-14 being created, it's because there are these charged particles that are coming out from space. Charged particles mean they have a magnetic charge. Charged particles are coming from out in space, hitting atoms of nitrogen, knocking off particles, okay? If you have a stronger magnetic field, guess what happens to charged particles from outer space? They can't get in. It blocks them. And so the stronger the magnetic field, the less, there, the less charged particles there are going to be coming in and the less carbon-14 you're going to have on the planet. On top of that, I already told you that the, that the uh, biology was different. Up to 500 times as much vegetation on the planet, now you've got less carbon-14 and more plants. And so what you're going to have is less carbon-14 in the plants at the very beginning. And so when you go to date them, they're going to date older just because there's less carbon-14 that they've consumed because there are more plants and less carbon-14 in the atmosphere. And that's the case. When, you, when you're dating something with carbon-14, it's only reliable to about 400 years BC. And then after that, it becomes a turkey shoot um, when they're doing historical things. And so anyway, uh, again, you, you, you have that whole thing. So just a couple of things you, that you could take away from uh, from from this this whole thing with that is that there is good evidence for what the Bible talks about. The Earth is not as old as they say it is. It can't be. Here's another thing. For carbon fourteen to work, there has to be an equilibrium. This is what this means. Up in the upper atmosphere, it's being made, and what happens is it filters down through the atmosphere, and it gets sucked into our lungs. It gets sucked into plant life that goes into the, into the dirt. And so that carbon-14 is coming into the, the ecosystem from the top, going out through the bottom. And there's going to be, at some point, as much going out as there is coming in. It's kind of like filling up a bathtub. If you fill up a bathtub and you let it overflow, 
When you reach equilibrium, that's when it's overflowing. There's no more water being added to the bathtub than, the, than there is going out, okay? Well, that's what you have with the Earth's atmosphere. Guess what? There is no equilibrium. Right now, and in fact, when they found out about carbon-14, as soon as they found out about it, they measured the amount of carbon-14 being made versus the amount of carbon-14 leaving the system. There is, there is more being made than there is leaving the system, which means that the bathtub is not full, okay? Metaphorically speaking. So the, Earth is, the Earth's atmosphere is not full of carbon-14, okay? You know how long it takes to get the Earth's atmosphere full of carbon-14? 30,000 years. We have a dating method for the Earth's atmosphere. There has to be an equilibrium of carbon-14 in the Earth's atmosphere by 30,000 years. That lets you know that the Earth's atmosphere is not 30,000 years old. It's got to be less than that, and that causes all kinds of problems. So anyway, all kinds of cool stuff that, that go along with that. I believe in Noah's flood. I believe that the, the, exactly what the Bible says is exactly how it happened. I believe that when God says something, he means it. And I believe that we can trust him on these things. I already went through and compared Noah's Ark to salvation. And in the same way, God spoke to Noah about his salvation from the flood. He said, what I want you to do is go prepare an ark. I want you to get ready because I'm bringing a flood on the earth. I'm going to judge the whole earth, but I'm not going to judge you. I'm, not going, to, I'm going to judge the whole earth, but I'm going to save you. And this is how I'm going to do it. And Noah obviously was involved in that whole thing, just in, in the, uh, as we are uh, involved in our salvation in the sense of we have to listen to God and we have to receive what he's given to us. And every time we um, practice communion, what we're doing is we're looking back on the salvation that God's given to us. And we're, it's a proclamation that we believe you, God. We're looking back and remembering what Jesus has done for us. And so in the same way that Noah trusted God, we trust God. In the same way that Noah trusted God for salvation, we trust God for salvation. In the same way that Noah was assured of his salvation in the sense that God said it's going to happen and then it happened, you can be assured of your salvation in the sense that God has said it's going to happen, you trusted him on it, and then all of a sudden everything changed. And we glorify God on, on, uh, uh, because of that, because of who he is. And so as we celebrate communion, um, it's one of those things that we need to keep in mind. I've trusted Jesus for my salvation, and he's come through on that. And I can trust him for a whole lot more than that, and he'll come through on those things too. And so as we partake, we need to remember him. You can come on up. Let's, let's read the passage and then, you know, again, we'll do it like we, like we do on, on uh, Wednesday nights and um, we'll sing and you guys will come up and get it. And let's go through the passage again. It says, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so as we partake of communion, we're remembering Jesus, remembering the fact that he died for us. And not only did he die, but um, he said that one of the ways that we were gonna know that he's the son of God is that he was gonna rise from the dead. And so intrinsic in this whole thing is I know that Jesus has saved me because not only did he die on a cross for my sin, but he rose from the dead to prove that he was the son of God. Proved to be the son of God by the resurrection from the dead. That's what Paul said in Romans chapter one. And that's what we have with Christ. The bread represents his broken body. The, the cup represents his shed blood that takes away my sin. And uh, we honor the Lord in this. So let's pray and uh, we'll sing. You guys can come up and get it. Lord, we thank you uh, again for the, the fact that you're a God who's truthful. You're a God who's trustworthy. And you're a God who we can take your word to the bank. Um, you've said certain things, and, and we know that when you tell us these things, they're going to happen. And you've told us that with each one of us, um, you had a plan for our life. And that when we came to you, that you would fulfill that plan. And Lord, we're looking forward to that final fulfillment when you come back for us. Lord, we thank you for dying for us. We thank you for um, uh, taking our sin upon yourself and just for the love that would cause you to do that. And we just want to honor you now as we worship you. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.